Thanks, Brian. Okay, so we've, uh, we've gone for a, a change in the after-dinner uh, presentation. Uh, historically, it's always been a very close link to aviation, it tends to be. We had uh, Sully here last year from the Hudson Bay. We've had astronauts, we've had uh, carrier deck uh, pilots, etc. This year, we saw somebody on the, uh, on the internet that we got through Bob Sheffield's first link on a, uh, on a TED program who talked about leadership, talked about innovation, inspiration, uh, motivation and all of the stuff that we really need to get if we're going to be leaders in safety and if we're going to be successful in safety. And Simon Sinek had, uh, did a presentation or a workshop earlier on this afternoon which was very thought-provoking. He's going to do a, a different theme this evening for us. Uh, he's going to use the, the basics of uh, audiovisual with a flip chart. Uh, he'll give a presentation and then there's going to be a Q&A session uh, towards the end. So there will be people with microphones wandering around. If you've got a question for Simon, uh, leave it to the end and he's happy to take any uh, Q&A as, um, as unfolds from the presentation. So, Simon, if I can ask you to come to the stage and, and do your stuff, thanks. I, I just realized um, what a dubious introduction um, and uh, that you all get that they found me on the internet. <laughs> I like that. Everybody else accomplished something and like landed planes on the Hudson River, but no, I, they found me on the internet. <laughs> Good luck to you all. <laughs> um, I, I like this idea of leadership. I like talking about it, I like learning about it, um, and I like meeting leaders. Um, but what I find very interesting is to have a discussion about leadership, very often we don't actually have a good definition of what a leader is. And so we engage in these discussions to try and figure out sort of what good leadership looks like and how we should do it, and yet we don't necessarily have an agreed upon definition. So let's, let's start there. Um, to be a leader requires one thing and one thing only, followers. That's it. It has nothing to do with rank. It has nothing to do with position. All it requires is that, is that someone else raise their hand and volunteer to go in the direction you point. That's all it takes. We can make people do things, but when someone chooses to go in a direction you set, sometimes at personal sacrifice, uh, then you are a leader. The question is, why should anyone follow you? As it turns out, there are two ways to influence human behavior. You can manipulate people or you can inspire them. Those are your options. In the business world, we are all very familiar with many manipulative techniques. Um, for example, price. Price is a manipulation. If you drop your price low enough, people will buy from you. This is the concept behind a sale. Things are priced to move, right? Uh, promotions, two for one, free toy inside, buy one, get one free. In the B2B space, we call it value added. <laughs> the concept is the same. It's giving stuff away for free to reduce someone's risks. So they'll choose you over the competition. It is highly manipulative. Um, what a lot of organizations like to call innovation is in reality novelty. Real innovation changes the course of industries if not the way we live our very lives. The fax machine, the light bulb, the microwave oven, iTunes, this is real innovation. Adding a camera to your cell phone is a wonderful feature, but it is not an innovation. It is the difference between steps and leaps. And what most organizations like to call innovation is in reality little steps or little novelties. I'll give you an example. In the 1970s, do you know how many choices of Colgate toothpaste there were? Two. Do you know how many there are now? Take a guess. 30. And that doesn't include the six for children, right? There are 30 different choices of Colgate toothpaste, and that's just Colgate, which means the competition is offering about the same number of products, about the same price, about the same quality, about the same service. There are literally hundreds of choices of toothpaste, and yet I have no data to show that we're brushing our teeth now more than we were 30 or 40 years ago. What happened, uh, began in about the late 1970s, was this annoying little thing called globalization. And markets expanded and, you know, and, and barriers to entry dropped. 
And so here you had a company that was doing just fine, and then as competition entered, they saw the metrics go down. Profit, market share, revenue, it doesn't matter, the metric went down. And so to combat this, they added a new product. This one has fluoride. And everybody went, ooh, shiny, and they all tried it. And the metric went up. But the problem with competition is they compete, and so the competition matched the product. And so they all had fluoride all of a sudden. And then the novelty wore off, and the metric went down again. Well, it worked the first time, so we'll do it again, and again, and again, and again, until you have 30 different line extensions. And what do so many companies complain about? How do we differentiate ourselves? This is very funny to me. Right? How do we get out of a problem that we created for ourselves? And so they resort to any number of other manipulations. And there are many other fears, a fantastic manipulator. You can scare people into doing all kinds of things. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, peer pressure, wonderful manipulator. We've all sat in our offices and had someone try to sell us something and told us that 70% of uh, your competition is using our service. Why aren't you? Maybe 70% of my competition are idiots. Maybe 70% of my competition uh, was offered a price so low they couldn't resist. I don't know. But when we hear that the majority is doing something, we fear that we're being left out of something or that they know something that we don't. And it affects our behavior. Do, do you remember that old um, TV commercial, four to five dentists prefer trident sugarless gum over the other? I always want to know what that one dentist knows that the, other is, that the others don't. And we could go on. There are many, many other manipulations. Um, the fact of the matter is, every single one of these manipulations works. That's why we use them. And we use them internally inside our own organizations as well. Any manner of carrots or sticks, you know, offers of, bound, offers of bounty or threats of punishment to get people to act one way or another. They are all highly, highly effective, which is why we use them. The problem is, none of them breed loyalty. The problem is, none of them engender trust. The problem is, over the course of time, they cost more money because someone has to pay for all this stuff. And over the course of time, it increases stress both for the buyer and for the seller. We live in a world in which people are bombarded every single day with manipulations from all sides. At work, at home, which television you're going to go buy, which cell phone company to use, all the time we are bombarded by manipulations. In other words, it is stressful to be a decision maker. It is hard to choose. We don't even know what's the right decision anymore because there's so much. But it's stressful for the sellers as well. In a world in which bombarding people with information is the norm, how do we truly stand out? How truly do we get heard if we have something special? It's called stress. And this is largely the world we work in today. But there's an alternative. And that alternative is called inspiration. And there are only a few leaders and a few organizations that tend to rely vastly more on inspiration than manipulation. And I'll talk about some of the big ones like Apple or Harley Davidson or Southwest Airlines. But you see it in great leaders as well, like JFK or Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King. What I learned is that regardless of their size and regardless of their industry, every single one of these leaders, every single one of these organizations think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to the rest of us. All I did was write it down. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. It's basically three concentric circles, a bullseye. In the middle is why, the center ring is how, and the outside ring is what. Why, how, what. It's this little idea that distinguishes those with the capacity to inspire versus everyone else. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single organization on the planet knows what they do. These are the products you sell, the services you offer, right? Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition, your proprietary process, your USP, whatever you want to call it. These are the things that you think make you different or special or stand out from the competition, stand out from the crowd. But very, very few organizations and very, very few people can clearly articulate why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make money. That's a result. By why, I don't mean to complete the mission. That's also a result. By why, I mean what is your purpose, what is your cause, what is your belief? Why does your company exist? I mean, do we really need another one? Why did you get out of bed this morning? 
and why should anyone care? As a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. We tend to go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. We tell people what we do, we tell them how we're different or how we're better and expect some sort of behavior. But not those leaders with the capacity to inspire. Every single one of them, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, thinks, acts, and communicates from the inside out. I'll give you an example. I use Apple frequently. Um, bless you. I use Apple frequently simply because they're easy to understand and we all get it. If Apple were like everyone else, a piece of communication would sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh, right? That's normal. Here's our new car. It's got tinted windows, great gas mileage, leather seats. Choose us, right? Here's our law firm. We've got all the best lawyers. We went to all the best schools. We win all of our cases. We work with some of the biggest companies. Choose us. This is normal. Here's how Apple actually communicates. They start with why. Everything we do, they say, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? It's totally different. No trickery, no manipulation, no celebrity endorsements. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it starts to show us is that it's not what you do that matters, it's why you do it. And people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. What you do simply serves as the tangible proof of what you believe. This is why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable with the idea that Apple sells computers and phones and DVRs and MP3 players. Apple's just a company, that's all they are. Every single one of their competitors, pick one, it doesn't matter, Dell, HP, Compaq, every single one of their competitors is equally qualified to make every single product that Apple makes. Every single one of them has equal and open access to the same consultants, the same agencies, the same media, the same talent, the same resources. It's a zero-sum game. The difference is their competitors have defined themselves by what they do. We make computers. Apple has defined themselves by why they exist, to challenge the status quo, to give the individual the opportunity to stand up to Big Brother and find a simpler alternative. And everything they say and everything they do simply serves as tangible proof of what they believe. Dell is a perfectly good company that makes perfectly good products that's every little bit qualified to make every single product that Apple makes. And a few years ago, they tried. A few years ago, they came out with MP3 players. And nobody bought one. Why would we buy an MP3 player from a computer company? It doesn't make sense. But we do it every day. Because it's not what you do that matters, it's why you do it. And people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I just said that. For this little thing to work, you have to have three things. Number one, you have to have clarity of why. If you don't know why you do what you do, how will anyone else? Two, you have to have discipline of how. You have to hold yourself and your people accountable to your own guiding principles and your own values. And thirdly, you have to have consistency of what? Everything you say and everything you do has to prove what you believe. This is the concept behind authenticity. It's getting boring listening to people tell us that we have to be authentic. People prefer to vote for the authentic candidate. They prefer to buy from the authentic brand. What authenticity means is the things you say and the things you do you actually believe. And when you tell people what you believe, they know what you believe and they're eerily drawn to you. How many of you uh, love your Apple computer or know somebody who loves their Apple computer? Okay? You can always tell people who love their Macs because when you try to explain to them, look, he raised both hands. You see that? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when you try to explain to them that they actually bought substandard computers, they start foaming at the mouth, right? <laughs> rationally speaking, rationally speaking, apples are at least 25% more expensive than their PC counterparts, sometimes double the price. <laughs> they can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. You're just encouraging them. <laughs> They're at least 25% more expensive, sometimes double the price. There's less software, there's fewer peripherals, and I know I have a Mac. There's nothing faster about them. I get the spinning beach ball of death all the time, right? In other words, rationally speaking, no one should ever buy one. But they do, over and over and over again. And they raise both hands and they heckle. They can't help themselves, right? They can't help themselves. 
right? They buy them over and over and over again because it's not about what the computer does, it's about what the computer stands for. Because Apple is so clear about what they believe, they're so disciplined about how they do it, and they're so consistent in what they do, it gets the point that everything they say and everything they do serves as a symbol of a set of values and beliefs. This is why people who love their Macs love opening their laptops in airports. They want everyone to see what computer they're using. And you'll never see someone put a big tiger print sticker over the top. They never cover up that beautiful glowing apple. And how many of you have ever broken out the Windex to clean your computer? If you have a Mac, you clean your computer. Because it's a symbol of who you are, and so you keep it clean. And you Mac lovers, don't lie to me. When you're walking through the airport, just minding your own business, and you see somebody else with an open Mac, you like them just a little more, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a simple reason for it. The human animal is a social animal. Our survival depends on our ability to find people who believe what, I, what we believe, to form cultures, to form societies, right? What is a culture? What is a society? It's a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs. What's a country? It's a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs. What's a company? It should be a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs. When we are surrounded by people who believe what we believe, something remarkable happens. Trust emerges. Make no mistake, trust is a feeling. Trust is a human condition. Simply doing everything you say you're going to do does not mean people will trust you. It simply means you're reliable. We all have friends that screw up sometimes, and yet we still trust them. Trust is born out of a common set of values and beliefs, and it is absolutely essential for our survival. When we are surrounded by people who we trust and they trust us, more, we're more willing to explore, we're more willing to experiment, we're more willing to turn our backs, all with the confidence that if we turn our backs, go away or fall down, someone will be there to pick us up, watch our backs, or watch our stuff when we're gone. Absent trust, it's every man for himself. Absent trust, all we have to do is look after ourselves. We still have the will to survive, but with no help, we only have the responsibility of ourselves. You want to know what happened at Lehman Brothers? Lehman, well, Lehman was exceptionally good at what they did. They were exceptionally good at how they did it. But there's no common sense of purpose or cause that held the people together, and at the slightest shimmy, the whole thing collapsed. Not in months, not in weeks, in days. Great organizations are the ones that in rough times, all the people come together to steer the ship through the hard waters. We don't judge the quality of a crew in calm waters. We judge the quality of a crew in rough waters. And in great organizations, people who trust each other rally together to save the ship. In weak organizations, people jump ship and say, got to look after numero uno, got mouths to feed, got bills to pay, got to look, look after myself. And off they run. And then the whole thing collapses. What I'm telling you is not my opinion. It's actually grounded in the tenets of biology. Not psychology, but biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain, what we see is that the human brain evolved into three major sections that corresponds precisely with this little idea. Our homo sapien brain, our rational brain, that corresponds with the what level, is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains. And our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, you can't ask people, why do you love doing business with us? They can't tell you, because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. This is why the question, why do you love your husband or why do you love your wife, is a difficult question. Why do you love your wife? I don't know. That's where most people start. And it's not that you actually don't know, it's that you, it's hard to put into words the feelings we have towards another person. And so we start with, I don't know. And then we start to rationalize. Uh, she's fun, I can trust her, she's always been there for me, I've known her forever. Um, <laughs> right, sounds like a golden retriever, right? Um, <laughs> And, and then we say things that don't even make sense, right? She completes me. I, I don't know what that means. It's like I have a left arm and a left leg. She has a right arm and a right leg. Together we make one. I mean, it's like she completes me. I don't even know what it means, right? My, my sister says of my brother-in-law, I get a kick out of this. My sister says of my brother-in-law, 
I never imagined I'd marry a guy like him, right? What she's basically saying is before I got married, I had a checklist of all the qualities I wanted in my future husband, and he doesn't have any of them, right? <laughs> and yet I fell in love with him anyway and decided I want to have a family with him and spend the rest of my life with him. In other words, it's not rational, right? Our ability, because it's very, very hard for us to put into words how we feel and our relationship with each other, and because finding people who believe what we believe is essential for, essential for our survival, we rely on all kinds of symbols and things to, imp, to tell people who we are so they can either be attracted to us or repelled by us. This is why authenticity matters. If you lie and present yourself as something who you are not, yes, people will be drawn to you. The problem is they'll get to you and be like, I don't know, there's just, I don't know, something doesn't feel right about him, I don't know, right? We talk about this like, he just gets it, he just doesn't get it. Well, get what? What is it, right? This is where gut decisions come from. There is no part of your stomach that controls decision making. And it's not in your blood, and it's not in your bones, and you're not following your heart, right? What we're doing is ascribing it to different parts of our body because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. The best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just feels right. It's not an accident that we use the verb to feel to describe a decision because the part of the brain that controls decision-making controls feelings. And so we're constantly relying on these symbols and things to say something about who we are, right? How many of you, let's pick a state, how many of you are from New York? Anyone? Anyone here from New York? No one? All right, Vancouver. All right. All right. Are you friends with everyone in Vancouver? Why not? You're all from Vancouver. When you go to Toronto and you meet somebody from Vancouver, you're like, hey, I'm from Vancouver, and you're like, besties, right? Because when we're in an environment where we don't feel like we belong, we seek out anyone who may share the same values and beliefs as us. And then you go to Paris, and you're standing on the Paris metro on holiday with your family, minding your own business, right? And you happen to hear a Canadian accent behind you, and you turn around and say, hey, where are you guys from? You're from Toronto? We're from Vancouver, right? <laughs> and you're like best friends, right? Again, because when you're in an environment where you don't feel like you belong, you seek out anyone who may share the same values and beliefs. At home, there's nothing special about you. But in, when you're in France, hearing their accent, a, they have a basic understanding of how you grew up, and you have a basic understanding of how they grew up, and the bond you form is very real. They'll turn to you and say, hey, you guys have to try this restaurant. And you'll turn to your spouse and say, honey, we've got to try this restaurant because strangers on a subway told us we have to. Don't you think if some Parisian bumped into you and said you have to try this restaurant, they're better qualified, but we would ignore them because we don't have any trust with them. Plus they're French. I... Here's, what's, here's what's disheartening for anyone who's French in the audience. I got more applause than booze. <laughs> I'm an Englishman. I have to say these things. It's in my contract. Otherwise, I lose my citizenship. Um, as opposed to my train of thought. <laughs> we rely on these things, as we rely on these things to find people who believe what we believe. So the more we demonstrate these things, and in reality, the modern day symbols that we can use are companies and our jobs and our brands and things like this. They say something about who we are. Companies that stand for something say something about who we are. I was um, flying Southwest Airlines not too long ago, and... Uh, I was flying by myself, and there was a woman flying by herself who was standing in front of me in line. Just minding my own business, she was minding her own business. And she turns around to me and she says, I love Southwest. I didn't ask, right? True story. But I realized what was happening. Because I'm by myself and she's by her herself, she's in a position of vulnerability. So she's looking for someone with whom she may form some sort of bond, right? It's a normal human thing. We want to feel like we belong. And because the part of the brain that controls behavior and all of this emotional stuff doesn't control language, she said to me, I love Southwest. She didn't say, I like Southwest. Like is rational. Good price, good quality, good people. I like Southwest. She said, I love Southwest. She's talking about this. So if I had said, me too, we'd walk down together, we'd sit together, we'd be friends, right? Or if I had said, yeah, I mean, they're okay, they're fine. I mean, I, I like them, they're good. She would have turned around and ignored me because she wasn't telling me about the airline. She was telling me about herself. 
And it's because Southwest has such a clear sense of purpose and, such, and are so disciplined in how they do things and so consistent in what they do, it gets to the point that everything they say and everything they do now serves as a symbol of a set of values and beliefs. And people who believe in that will use Southwest to say something about who they are, which is why they use viscerally, I love Southwest. I play this little game with people with their jobs sometimes. You know? You know, I say, do you like your job? Yeah, I really like my job. I like the, I, I like the people. I like the challenge. I, I, I get paid well. I, I really like my job. I'm like, do you love your job? They go, well, I wouldn't go that far. You know? In other words, we know there's a hierarchy. You know? We know there's a hierarchy. The opportunity is to use our jobs and use the things we say and do to find people who believe what we believe. And in a business world, this is what breeds trust and loyalty. In other words, sometimes when you screw up, sometimes you're not the cheapest, sometimes you're a little more expensive, sometimes when people suffer a little bit of inconvenience, they're still willing to do business with you and go out of their way and talk about you, not because you're the best rationally, but because you help them embody a set of values and beliefs, right? Because when all you have is price, quality, service, and features, the traditional business differentiators, you are, congratulations, a commodity. In other words, you don't stand for anything. And the business that you pick up is up and down, up and down, if you happen to be, meet one of these things at the right time. Trust and loyalty come from here. What I'm telling you is important for another reason. Something called the law of diffusion of innovations. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. It's the old bell curve, the old standard deviation. And what the law of diffusion tells us is that the first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. The next 34% are your early majority. The next 34% are your la uh, late majority. And the last 16% are your laggards. The only reason these people buy touch-tone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, my, it's my parents. Uh, what the law of diffusion tells us is that this population, the innovator and the early adopter population, are very comfortable trusting their guts. They're very comfortable making intuitive decisions. These are the people who are willing to pay a premium or suffer inconvenience to be a part of something that reflects what they believe. These are the people that stood in line for six hours to buy iPhones when they first came out, even though you could just go into the store the following week and buy one off the shelf. Right? These are the people who spent forty or $50,000 to buy flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. It had nothing to do with the technology. It had to do with them. It said something about who they are. This population, the majority, is much more cynical and much more practical. They absolutely care about things like pr price and quality and service and features. The problem is you cannot achieve mass market success, mass market acceptance for an idea, or long-term stability until you've achieved between 15 and 18 percent market penetration. And by market penetration, I don't mean of the market, I mean of the people who believe what you believe. This is the tipping point, a social phenomenon. Because what happens is when you reach that tipping point, all of a sudden it goes like this, and then this population buys in. You see, this population will not try something until someone else has tried it first. These are the people we have to drop our price, offer value add, and all kinds of other advantages and guarantees because they won't try something first. These people happily pay a premium, suffer inconvenience, and will do business with some standard product because they want to be a part of something that reflects who they are. If you ignore everything I'm telling you, I promise you every single person here has about 10% super loyal people who love you. In other words, law of averages will dictate that you can get about 10%, but it's not enough to make it tip. This is what Jeffrey Moore calls crossing the chasm. This, this is the little chasm, right? Because it's hard to get that last little bit. I'll give you uh, two examples of a, a famous success and a famous failure, a business one and a social one. First, the famous failure. It's from business. You know TiVo, right? The, the digital VCR, digital video recorder um, brand. TiVo was introduced into the marketplace about 13 to 14 years ago. And from the day it was introduced to the market to this current day, it is the single highest quality product on the market, hands down, undisputed. The technology is fantastic. Execution, flawless. Brilliant product, right? Uh, venture capital up the wazoo. 
So money was not a problem. They hired the best brains they can get, so the engineers they have are fantastic. And the market conditions are amazing. We use TiVo as a verb. I TiVoed something, right? right? In other words, all the reasons that people tell you something failed, we didn't have enough money, undercapitalized, we had the wrong people, poor execution, bad market conditions, usually some combination of those explain every failure. TiVo is in the clear. They have all of them, except for the fact that TiVo's never made money. They are a commercial and financial failure. And when the company went public, it launched about 40 or 50 bucks, very quickly plummeted, and except for a couple of little blips, it has never traded above $10 ever. And the reason is, is because they took this brilliant product, brilliantly executed, brilliantly funded, and they attempted to tell the mass market what it does. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, and records on your behalf without you even asking. And the cynical, practical majority said, don't need it, don't like it, don't believe you, you're scaring me. And so they didn't buy one. There were a few early adopters who did, and to this day they love their TiVos and have a great upgraded all the time. It wasn't enough to make it tip. But imagine if they had talked to this population and told them why the product exists. Imagine that they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, and records on, your, records on your behalf without you even asking. In this instance, what the product does serves as tangible proof of why it exists, and it's not the reason you buy the product in the first place. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do serves as the tangible proof of what you believe. Now I'll give you my favorite example. Dr. Martin Luther King, in the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King give his famous I Have a Dream speech. There were no emails sent out, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? What are there, like 800 people here today? How many emails did you get to come here today? Right? <laughs> I got seven. <laughs> right? There was none of that. Dr. King was not the only man in America who knew what had to change to bring about civil rights in that country. Dr. King was not the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, he suffered less than most because he was off at university. Dr. King was not the only great orator. And Dr. King wasn't even a perfect man. He had his complexities, and we don't even talk about that stuff. The difference is, King did not go around telling people what we need to do, what we need to do, how we need to do it. He went around and told people, I believe, I believe, I believe. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and made it their own. And they told people what they believed. And those people who believed what they believed took that cause and made it their own. And they told people what they believed. And some built structures to get out the word more efficiently. And lo and behold, on the right day, on the right time, 250,000 people showed up on the mall to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed. It was the country that they wanted to live in. It was the country that they wanted to raise their children in that inspired them to get on a bus, travel for eight hours, stand in the sun in Washington in the middle of August simply to hear him speak. Simply going to that event was one of the things they did in their lives to prove what they believe. Oh, and by the way, Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech, not the I Have a Plan speech. Ain't nobody inspired by your 12-point plan. It's the reason why the plan exists in the first place that inspires people to want to join and be a part of it. Leaders do two things that help advance this. Let's imagine we're all out on a three-hour boat tour, right? And we get stranded on a desert island, right? So here we are, we're all stranded on the desert island. The question is, how are we gonna get, how are we gonna get off the island? So one of us stands up and says, I will lead. We like that, we're social animals, we like leaders. And she says, okay, who's got ideas? You. You think we should build a boat. I like it. I like it. You. You think we should light a fire. Good, good, good. You. You think we should forage for food. Good. Okay, let's take a vote. And at the same time, somebody else stands up and says, as we were coming into the island, way off on the west side of the island, I saw some masts and some smoke. There's a fishing village over there. And if we can get to that fishing village, I know we can get rescued. The question I have for all of you is, who would you rather follow, this first person or the second person? The second person. There is no evidence that that fishing village exists. There's no photographs and nobody else saw it. All we have is the undying belief of one person of a future state that does not yet exist, and it inspires us to want to go and, and help achieve it. I have no idea how to get there, but I'll help. 
We are inspired by visions of the future. And this is what leaders do. Not only do leader, leaders have a vision of the future that does not yet exist, but they have the ability to articulate it, the ability to communicate it. We all work with people who are visionary people but no ability to communicate. And all they do is walk around frustrated that nobody else gets it. Wonderful people, but they're not leaders. We also work with people who are wonderful orators, great communicators, and they can all make us feel fantastic with all the speeches they give. The problem is, at the end of the speech, we have no idea how to get off the island. What great leaders do is articulate a future vision. They have a future vision of the, of the world that does not yet exist and the ability to communicate it. They've done these wonderful studies where they take people and they drop them in the middle of the woods and they say it's very easy to get out of the woods. All you want to do is walk in a straight line in a westerly direction. Oh, and by the way, west is that direction. To the people they give a compass, they walk straight out of the woods, no problem. The people they don't give a compass to, however, walk in circles convinced they're walking in straight lines. Companies are exactly the same. Without a clear sense of direction, we walk in circles convinced we're walking in straight lines. And we're so proud of ourselves because we're busy, busy measuring how many steps we're taking, yet we have no idea where we're going. You often hear this, you know, when they find a dead hiker. You know, they always say they were retracing their own steps. This is normal. And yet, this is what we do. We count all the metrics in our business. We talk about our revenues and our profits and all of this. And yet, why are we on the journey in the first place? What direction are we heading? This is what we do. We count our steps. Very proud because our goal was to walk 100 steps today. And we walked 103. We're above goal. You're walking in circles. If I was to empty this room and... We would stand by ourselves in the corner, and I give you a very simple instruction. I want you to walk to that corner in a straight line. Off you go, no big deal. And without telling you, I quickly put a chair in front of you. What do you do? You go around the chair. Now, you just ignored what I told you to do. I told you to go to that corner straight line. But this is the wonderful thing about human beings. When we have a clear sense of where we're going, we are flexible in how we get there. That's called innovation. That's called problem solving. We will easily figure out a way around the obstacle when we know where we're going. Reset. We stand back in the corner. I give you a very simple instruction. I want you to go to a straight line at some point in this room. And you say to me, well, what point do you want me to go to? I'm like, I don't know. You're smart. Find a point. And so you pick an arbitrary point in the room, and you start walking. And without telling you, I quickly put a chair in front of you. And what do you do? You come to a grinding halt, or you make a sudden sharp turn. And I say, what are you doing? You say, well, like, how do I go? You put a chair in front of me. And this is exactly what we do in business, which is the points we pick are arbitrary. They're not clear senses of destination. They're not visions of the future that don't exist. You know, our goal this year is to increase top-line revenues by $10 million. Why not 12? Why not 8? They're arbitrary points in the room. And when we face obstacles, we all of a sudden, we become obsessed with the strategy. The strategy was going a straight line, and we have to stick to the strategy. Not so. The strategy is adaptable when we have a clear sense of where we're going. And great leaders don't tell us how to get there. They tell us where we're going, and they leave it up to us to figure out how to get there. As my friend David Marquet always says, the people at the top have all the authority and none of the context, and the people at the bottom have all the context and none of the authority. And not until when leaders allow people to make decisions for themselves and simply set the course and allow people to figure out how to get there will we live in a world in which we'll actually advance towards a clear destination as opposed to walking in circles convinced that we're making progress and yet we wake up at the end of the day after a career, five years, ten years, and we're like, what's it all worth? Because we have no sense of what we're advancing in the world. We have no sense of any purpose. We have no sense that we've done anything in the world. I'll tell you one last story. In August of 2011, I went to Afghanistan with the United States Air Force. Um, I do some work with the mobility forces, and the general said to me, you know, you do a lot of work with us, you know a lot about us, but I would love for you to see um, our men and women in action. Would you be willing to go to Iraq or Afghanistan? So I said, sure, I'll go, and they picked Afghanistan. And I didn't tell my family that I was going because I didn't want them to worry. It's not like I could, like, text them. I'm, huh, I'm here, you know. So I just figured I wouldn't tell them. I'll tell them when I get back. And the first... Uh, leg of the trip was we flew from Dover, Delaware on a C-5 to Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. We changed planes onto a KC-135 and flew into Bagram. We, were on, we landed in Bagram in the middle of the night and we were on the ground for 10 minutes. The big side door was open on the side of the plane and the base came under rocket attack. You could hear it come in. <laughs> Sirens blaring over the loudspeakers telling us to go to, our, uh, to, to seek safety and they told us to stay on the plane. None of us put on our body armor because what would be the point? 
And strangely, we were very relaxed. And for anyone who's ever been in a war zone, as you know, you have all the feelings you'd expect to have, but you don't have them at the right times. So here I was, even me, a civilian, very relaxed, uh, where four hours before we landed, I was petrified. We finally got the all clear, and we took our stuff, and we went to our barracks, back, went to our room, and we were supposed to be in country for up to 30 hours to try and get on an airdrop mission, because, you know, we have to find one. Me and two escorts, me and two officers who I went with. The good news is we found one that was leaving very early in the morning, so we got about two and a half hours, three hours of sleep, and got out of bed and went to our airdrop, and it was really great. We got on a C-17, we flew out for about an hour and a half, dropped down to about a 2,000 feet, the back door open and all the, you know, all the supplies flew out the back with parachutes and we supplied an army forward operating base. It was amazing, exciting, fantastic. And then we flew back. And now the goal was to get out of Dodge. I had no reason to be there. I was just an observer. And now we've exhausted our, our welcome. It's time to leave. And so we found a flight that we could get on, always up to the discretion of the pilot, an outbound aeromedical mission, which meant they were taking out wounded warriors. And we said, can we get on your plane? They said, we need you to hang out. So we waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And finally, they said, thumbs up. We got on the plane. We're literally all strapped in five minutes from leaving. And they said to us, um, we need to bump you. We need more room for stretchers. And if there's ever a reason to be bumped off a plane, this is a good one. So we got off the plane. And we went to find another flight. And that's when we found out that there would be no other flights until Tuesday. This was only Saturday. I was now stuck in Afghanistan for at least four days, no guarantee that we'd get on a Tuesday flight. And I had no way of letting my folks know that I wasn't going to be home. Everything in my body sank. Every muscle went down. My stomach sank. I became immediately depressed. I didn't want to be there anymore. I regretted my decision. I didn't want to be there. And all I became preoccupied was my safety, my comfort, my happiness. And I didn't care who had to turn themselves in knots to get me what I needed. One of the public affairs officers said, I can get you on a flight to Kyrgyzstan, but you don't have the right visas. To which I responded, you get me on that plane. I don't talk to people that way. And yet I was. I was becoming that boss that we've all had that only cares about their promotion, their bonus, their advancement, and yet they don't care who has to turn themselves into knots to get them what they want. That was me. We went to our room, and I lay down on the bed and shut my eyes. I couldn't sleep because my mind was racing, and I didn't know what to do. One of the officers said, I'm going to see if I can find us another flight, and he left. And the other one said, well, I guess I'll go to the gym, and he left. And because he thought I was sleeping, he shut off the lights, and he left. And I started trying to solve this problem. I didn't want to be there. I regretted everything about it. I, was, I, I didn't know what to do. I started Victor Frankling myself, anybody who's read Man's Search for Meaning. He said, we cannot control the circumstances around us. All we can control is our attitude. So I said to myself, OK, Simon, change your attitude. You can't control the circumstances. Change your attitude. To which my exact words to myself were, go F yourself, you know? <laughs> Turns out that when you're in a bad mood and somebody says, cheer up, it doesn't work, right? So that didn't work. And so, again, I'm in the purpose business. And so I'm like, all right, the reason you feel disconnected, the reason you feel like this way is because you don't have a sense of purpose. You don't have a reason to be here. And so I started trying to invent one. You're here to tell their story. You're here to uh, sort of go back home and sort of report back what's really going on here. And that didn't work. And we do this in our businesses as well. We back into purpose. You're here to drive the economy. And we just make stuff up. And it's not really the reason we can't wait to get out of bed. And I realized what was happening to me is I was living a, a, I was living a life all compressed into 24 hours. I was living a life where I hated my job all compressed. You know, where we mistake these moments of excitement and these moments of joy for being happy, and yet the reality is we don't want to wake up and do it again the next day. This was the life I was living. And so I lay there absolutely depressed. And I gave up. I literally just gave up. And I figured if I'm stuck here, I might as well make myself useful. I'll volunteer to speak if they want me to speak. I'll carry boxes, I'll sweep floors, I don't care. And instantly I felt fine. The minute I committed myself to giving to those who give to others, to serving those who serve others, immediately I relaxed and felt fine. I was actually excited to be a part of it. As if it were a movie, the timing was weird. The door flew open and it was Major Throckmorton. He said, I got us on a flight. There's been a flight that's redirected. We've got to go, we've got to go now. If we don't go now, we're going to miss the flight. We've got to go now. Where's Matt? I'm like, he's not, he's at the gym. So we ran to the gym, we get him off his treadmill, we rush back, no time for him to change, he quickly puts on his uniform, no time to shower, and we rush out, we grab our stuff and rush out to the plane. We can see our, our, uh, the, our flight, our plane sitting out there on the, on the tarmac, and just as we get there, the, the whole runway shuts down and the security cordon comes down, because there's a fallen soldier ceremony. And when there's a fallen soldier ceremony, everything stops out of respect. 
And so we just sat on the curb and waited. And I told the guys what I went through in that bed, and I cried like a baby as I told them. And this is one thing that a lot of people don't realize about the military. Crying is just fine. The security cordon finally came up. The, the ceremony was over, and we walked out to our C-17. We would be the only three passengers aboard this aircraft. What I haven't told you is the reason this flight was redirected is because we would be carrying home the soldier for whom they just had the ceremony. We climbed on board the plane and waited for the army to arrive. And we stood at the back of the plane. And finally, the army showed up with a flag-draped casket. And all the Air Force stood at attention to receive the casket. I put my hand on my chest because I'm a civilian. I kind of felt like an idiot. And so I, too, stood at attention as we received this hero. The army walked, marched the casket to the middle of the aircraft, laid him down, and did a slow eight-count salute. turned, marched off the plane, and we watched them hug and cry as they walked out of sight. The Air Force crew got to work and started strapping the casket down. This would be a nine and a half hour overnight flight. I sat about here, and the casket was about there. On every other flight I took, we had a good time, we talked, we joked. In this flight, we barely said a word to each other. On every other flight, I was spent time hanging out on the flight deck. This flight, I didn't visit the flight deck once. Once we were in the sky, we laid out our sleeping bags and everybody staked a piece of real estate somewhere in the aircraft and we tried to get some sleep. But every time I would open my eyes, I'd be greeted by the image of that <coughs> aluminum flag-draped casket that we all have seen on television. I got to tell you, it was one of the greatest honors of my life. Having just had this experience and learned what purpose really means, serving those who serve others, I get the great, great honor of getting to bring home someone who knows a lot more about service than I do. We get to Ramstein and we finally catch our final flight home, which is a flight on a, another C-17 back home, an aeromedical mission with 37 wounded warriors, one Marine in critical condition. His buddy had stepped on an IED and was killed. He took the shrapnel, two broken legs, two broken arms, shrapnel in the chest, broken eye socket, punctured eyeball. I've never seen a body this broken, and I was very nervous to go up to him when he was at the back, back there of the plane. But I finally did. I went up and I talked to the docs who were looking after him, and they took me through all his wounds and what they were doing. And the doc was amazing. He was a reservist from a hospital in Austin who works in an ER at a hospital in Austin. And he was so excited to tell us what was going on because even in this condition, all the medical advancements and all the trauma care that are, that's happening in the military that's filtering its way down to civilian hospitals, in other words, even in this condition, they're still giving back to us. And I asked him what I thought was a funny question. I said, look, you're an ER doc. You do amazing work. You work, you work in an ER back home. Do you have a different sense, of, different sense of fulfillment here than you do back at home? And he said, there's no comparison. He said, 90 to 95% of the people who come into the ER back home are either drunks or idiots. That's the reason they're in the ER in the first place. He says, there's not a single drunk or idiot here. The sense of pride and fulfillment that I get serving these men is no comparison to what I do at home. This is where your fulfillment comes from. The opportunity to wake up every single day and serve those who serve others. To give to people who give to others is the greatest gift we can have in the world. It is the greatest reward we can have in the world. This is what gives our life a sense of purpose. It's the reason why we do what we do. There are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or influence or rank, but those who lead inspire us. And whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. This is for the people who want to inspire others, and this is for the people who want to find somebody to inspire them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very generous. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for just a couple questions, if you have any. <laughs> End on a heavy note. Yeah. 
Yeah. Say again. So the question is, what advice do I have for the leaders? Um, leadership is a responsibility. It is not a rank or a position. And many people in leadership positions forget that they have a responsibility for human beings. You cannot lead a company. You lead people, always. And there's a cost for leadership, and that cost is self-interest. Um, and what you find is that great leaders are willing to sacrifice themselves for each other. In the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others so that we may gain. <laughs> Backwards. Right? <laughs> and, and, and fundamentally, the job of leadership is not an easy job. It is a, a job that requires more work, not less work. And all the trappings we get and advantages and higher salaries and better parking spaces, all of that is, comes at a cost. And that cost is our willingness to sacrifice ourselves, our well-being, and sometimes the numbers, so that others will survive and do well and feel safe. Those are leaders. But the we leaders who are willing to sacrifice people to save numbers, they, they're just in leadership positions. They're no leaders. So the advice I would give to leaders is think of yourselves as parents, right? The corporation is a modern invention. The nation state is a modern invention. There's only one thing that predated all those things, and that's the family. And great leaders are like great parents, which is all they want, is to provide education and training and teach, provide opportunities, discipline sometimes, and help build the confidence of the people who work for them in their care so they can grow up one day and achieve more than we ever could achieve for ourselves. It is the exact same thing. So for, for the advice I would give to leaders is care about people first. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, without doubt, the best thing I've ever found on the internet, uh, Simon Sinek. <laughs>